Hello and welcome everybody to the information session for the MA in Human Rights at the Catholic University of America. My name is Megan Witt. I graduated from the MA in Human Rights program in 2023, and I am currently the student program specialist for the Institute for Human Ecology. The Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America is the leading academic institution committed to identifying the economic, cultural, and social conditions vital for human flourishing. Drawing on the Catholic intellectual tradition, the mission of the IHG is to educate students, sponsor multidisciplinary research, advise church leadership, and organize symposia, conferences, and lectures for the academy and the public square. IHG programs challenge the materialistic and reductionist world views of institutions, policymakers, and opinion formers that stand in the way of prosperity and human dignity. Professor William Saunders here is a graduate of Harvard Law School and has been involved in issues of public policy, law, and ethics for over 30 years. A regular columnist for the National Catholic Bioethics Quarterly, Professor Saunders has written widely on these topics as well as on Catholic social teaching. He has lectured in law schools and colleges throughout the United States and around the world. Professor Saunders' latest book, Unborn Human Life and Fundamental Rights, Leading Constitutional Cases Under Scrutiny, was published in 2019. He is the director of the MA in Human Rights program and also acts as a consultant to the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops Committee on International Justice and Peace. He is also the director of the Center for Human Rights, where he works closely with our distinguished fellow, Chen Guanchen. Today, we will talk about the purpose of the MA program in human rights, why it is relevant today, the curriculum, professional advantages that the program has to offer, who would benefit from the program, and admission requirements. Please feel free to um, submit any questions in the Q&A section at any time during the presentation, and we will answer them at the end. Also, this video will be available on our website following the presentation. So, Professor Saunders, we can start with the basics. Why a program in human rights? You know, I do want to do that, Megan. I just want to say one thing first, which I think uh, will be a question you get to later, but I do want the people listening, my qualifications to do this are not, uh, are not, I was, I don't know what the right word is, solely or merely academic. Uh, I founded a human rights organization uh, which worked in a, a country where genocide was going on. And I also uh, have worked internationally in various configurations for many years. And when George W. Bush was president of the United States, the United States I served on the U.S. delegation to the U.N., so I bring that into my experience, as we'll talk more about later, into this course, which is both uh, academic and practical. But would you ask your question again, Megan? Yes. My question was, why a graduate program in human rights? Yeah, well, really building on what I said before, uh, and I understand that we have people interested from other countries. Um, so I, my question in a sense is, somewhat U.S. based, but it's probably true in whatever country you're from. Um, we don't hear in the discussion about human rights, the Catholic voice here in the United States and here in Washington, D.C. And I think it's the vital voice. I think it's the most important voice, but it's certainly a voice that should be in the conversation. I think anybody listening to this uh, is interested in human rights. And I think that you are just like everybody else your age, excuse me, or people of any age, which is, you know, in your kind of heart or in your soul that there are human rights. <clears throat> the problem is when human rights are talked about in a way that is uh, untrue, 
or misleading uh, or advances agendas that are in fact against human rights. So the purpose of this program is to give you an interdisciplinary understanding of human rights, which means a Catholic understanding because uh, Catholics always understand that there's multiple uh, kind of perspectives on the truth. If you are a Christian and you were aware in the early ages of the church, we have four gospels. And some people said, well, we should just have one gospel. And in fact, there was a one gospel put together from the four. But the Catholic Church always said, no, these are four important witnesses to the same truth. And there's slight differences among them. It's like if we were all sitting in a room and we were looking up at a diamond, we'd have a slightly different perspective. So our program's interdisciplinary because we want to get the philosophical, the political science or political theory, the law, and theology to give us uh, a perspective and then crowned by Catholic social thought, which really brings all those things together. But we, we, uh, so the reason we need this degree is we need people who understand the Catholic understanding of human rights in the public conversation. That's the reason. Absolutely. And I think that is a very unique aspect of this program is it really does educate the students in the Catholic perspective, as well as all of the other perspectives, giving that kind of well-rounded, but able to defend any sort of thought. Um, speaking of the Catholic perspective, the MA program has been entrusted to St. Josephine Bakita. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, in fact, here's a prayer card of, of St. Bakita. Uh, for those of you that don't know, she was uh, she's from Sudan. She was taken as a slave as a little girl, uh, and she uh, subsequently ended up in Italy as she became a member of the Kenosian Sisters. And in the year 2000, in the Holy Jubilee year of 2000, she was canonized in Rome. When I said before I'd started an NGO, I, the NGO I started was working in Sudan when there was persecution, uh, genocide, and chattel slavery, which means buying and selling people. So Bakita is a great saint because she, and when I went to Sudan, uh, kind of uh, in the area where the people were being uh, suffering bombardment and, and uh, had been driven from their homes, and they didn't have anything left. Uh, they didn't have anything. They weren't even living where they used to live. They didn't have clean water. Uh, their lives were hanging by a thread. And there was a tremendous amount of uh, faith in, say, uh, at that point, Blessed Bakita. And that's when I first encountered her, and there was a lot of praying for people, asking Bakita to help them, because Bakita is actually from the late uh, 1800s, so she's uh, about, you know, over 100 years ago, but the people there knew she would intercede for them. So she is a great saint. She is the patroness of our master's program, and she is the worldwide patroness of the Catholic Church against human trafficking. What an incredible saint to have associated with the program. Um, let's move away from the Catholic perspective and talk about maybe some professional advantages that this program might offer. Well, I, I do you mean, I mean, one advantage is being in Washington, D.C. I mean, Washington, D.C., again, I know some of you are not a, a USA citizens, but I'm sure you know this as well. So much of what happens in the world is influenced by the USA. So being in Washington, D.C., where you have the Congress, we obviously have the president, but you have the administrative uh, agencies like the State Department. You have the Congress with all its committees dealing with international relations. And you have almost every NGO uh, in the world has headquarters here. That's an advantage to be here. And then through my uh, my life of doing this work, I have connections throughout the NGO world. And we take advantage of those by giving students the opportunity to meet 
people who do human rights work to discuss with them how they do it and for the student to be able to think about how they might make a career in human rights. So those are some of the advantages. Mm -hmm. And those meetings were always so beneficial, just being able to see the different types of human rights work, the different organizations that exist um, for students who might one day want to open their own NGO or nonprofit. It's, it's a truly incredible experience to be able to hear from people who have already been through those processes. Yeah, and I, I just want to add to that, Megan, that, uh, again, I, I know folks listening may be different ages from different places, but I don't expect anybody who's starting this master's to know everything about human rights, obviously, but and one of the things you might not know is how many organizations there are and how many issues they're working on. So part of what we do is to give you an exposure to that so you can, you know, you might have a vocation to do a particular kind of work, and but you might not know it. So part of the way you would discern that is by being in situations where you can talk to people who do the work, <clears throat> and you might learn of something you didn't know about before. And um, you might also, one of the things that I like to do is for us to hear from the people who do the work, how their own lives unfolded. Uh, people's, you don't, you don't know when you begin where you're going to end. Um, so to hear people discuss how they manage to do human rights work may give you an idea of how you can do human rights work, a new idea. So I think that is also uh, a real advantage. Mm -hmm. And just to add to that advantage is having a network of people who have those experiences, um, that, that continues to grow after the master's program and you get to maintain those relationships that you make. And so another really important aspect of the program is creating that network of all of those experienced, knowledgeable, and incredible human rights activists. Um, speaking of incredible human rights activists, could you talk a little bit about those on the advisory board for the MA? Yeah, I am very proud of that. If you visit our webpage, you will see uh, various people um, who I think you, some of whom you will already know, but all of whom are really incredibly uh, experienced and important parts of our program, they, these people I'm about to mention usually meet with our students. Sometimes they teach a class for our students. Like this semester, Father Kevin Flannery from the Gregorian University, the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, is going to teach a class for us. Robert George at Princeton uh, has taught a class uh, for us. Uh, probably will not do it this spring, but probably do it next year. Uh, so I'll just mention some others. So those are two other people. Another one is Marianne Glendon, who is the Emeritus Professor of Law at Harvard, where I went to law school. And she is the uh, most eminent figure in the United States in the field of human rights. Uh, she was the person chosen to be the chair of the uh, U.S. Commission on Unalienable Rights. And I won't go into a lot of detail of that, but that's a Another thing a, stu a student would have an advantage of, we study that report because it looked at how to integrate human rights in the foreign policy of the United States, and that gives a, a model to reflect on from whatever country you happen to be from. But anyway, she was picked uh, to be the chair of that. We also have Helen Alvare, who is a law professor here in Washington and who is previously the spokesperson of the U.S. Bishops conference on pro-life issues. We have Tom Farr, who was uh, the head of the Religious Freedom Institute, which was, uh, for those, I assume most people listening are Catholics, you may already know this. You'll certainly hear about it in our program, but religious freedom is what Pope John Paul II called the first freedom. It's the essential freedom because with that, that is the space in which you get to find your vocation and respond to God. So he started an institute that works on guaranteeing religious freedom for people both around the world and at home. Also, John DiUlio, who's an eminent uh, professor at the University of Pennsylvania, 
um, and um, Monsignor Anthony Frontero, who was a diplomat uh, from for the Holy See, both at the UN and with the Dicastery for International Peace and Justice in Rome. So he worked all over the world on human rights issues. Uh, I, when I was at the UN, I was actually at the same time he was with the Holy See. So we worked on some things together and he teaches some of our classes, but it, you know, it's just an incredible, I think an incredible advantage for student to get to hear from uh, a Vatican diplomat of how you do human rights work internationally. Another member of the board is Yuri Mantia, who is uh, from Bolivia. He is an international uh, law professor and very experienced in international uh, affairs. Uh, before he was at the law school, he was involved particularly in international things. He's been es educated uh, both in, or in the U.S., in the Ukraine, and in China. Uh, excuse me, have I forgotten somebody? I don't have the list in front of me. But um, we have Juan Carlos Rio Frio. Oh yes, well he is he's an international law professor uh, who uh, is currently working in Africa and gives a lot of good perspective of of uh, an international perspective on human rights. Anybody else, Megan? That's everyone. Okay, so it's an incredible board. It's very experienced, very knowledgeable uh, in human rights, uh, all of whom are available to my students. Uh, you can start to build relationships with these people if you wish to do so. Uh, so I don't think there's any other program. I do want to say I don't think there's any other, pro there's certainly no other program like mine in the U.S., where we look at human rights in the way I describe. And I don't think there's any program in the world that has a better board than I have, advisory board. Absolutely. I would have to agree. And another aspect of that is you as program director. It has been such an incredible experience to have you as a mentor. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you became passionate in human rights and maybe some advice to those thinking about entering into that field? Did you say about how I became uh, involved in human rights? Yes. Well, uh, I believe that uh, everybody has a personal vocation, but I also believe that there's no way to know that. Um, you can only live in the in the moment. You can think about the future, but you can't live in the future. And you can plan for things, but there's no way you can guarantee how things are going to unfold. And I think your life unfolds uh, through your interaction with the Holy Spirit. So I, what, we said, I'm a lawyer, and I was doing different kinds of law, and then I was working in a human rights group because I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, and I wasn't even sure I wanted to do human rights work at the point, that point. But at that point, uh, I met a bishop from Africa, uh, from Sudan, and he had come to Washington, D.C. To, to kind of raise the alarm about Islamic fundamentalism and how it was threatening his, his people in Sudan. And uh, I helped him with one or two things. And then he asked me to, to really jump in with both feet and help him. And so I did. I set up my own NGO. And uh, I kind of had really had two full-time jobs. But as that unfolded it's in my own life, the same time uh, was John Paul II, and uh, was Pope, and he he wrote from the beginning about human rights, and I was getting very interested in John Paul II. Uh, it had been just a few years earlier than that that I had become a Catholic, and I had influenced to become a Catholic a lot by John Paul II. Um, I do, I'll show you this for anybody who hasn't seen it. Of course, if you go to our webpage, you'll see it, but John Paul II, along with Mother Teresa, are 
and St. Bikita are the three saints really of our program. Um, I mean, our perspective, like with Mother Teresa, is if you want to see what uh, hum- kind of what it means to respect human dignity is learn about what she did, how she did it, what she has to say about it. Uh, it's kind of like Jesus says in the Bible, you know, follow me, follow Mother Teresa, see, you know, see what she was doing. And of course, John Paul II was having a tremendous influence in the world on human rights. So I was doing this work with this bishop. Uh, in fact, we ended up, people can see this poster on the wall. It's a, it's a film that we did that, uh, or with uh, collaborators actually in Hollywood, uh, Catholics in Hollywood, uh, about what was going on called uh, War and Faith in Sudan. So, but the point I'm trying to make is I never, I had no idea that Bishop would walk through the door. I had no idea he would ask me to do something and that I would say yes. Um, and I had no idea it was unfold the way it did. Um, so it's unpredictable. And then from that work with him, I was heavily involved in human rights issues ever since, and particularly for a long time with China. We can talk about that Um but also internationally, because I, as I became a Catholic, um, it became clear both that the first freedom was the religious freedom and the first lo- right is the right to life. And all of that comes directly from John Paul II. So my whole professional life really has been influenced by the teaching of the Catholic Church, but particularly John Paul II. So um, does that answer your question? Absolutely. And you mentioned your work with China. Could you talk a little bit about that as well as your work with Chen Guangcheng? Yeah, I I, uh, I think that right now in the world, the greatest threat to human rights really is the Chinese Communist Party. And part of the reason for that is cause, uh, obviously because of their material and uh, military strength. But the other part is they're really pioneering uh, a surveillance state that threatens all freedom. Uh, as Guang Chen will say, they have over 250 million cameras watching you in China now. And if anybody listening has never read the book 1984, if this is the first time you've heard about it, go out when this is over to the bookstore or Amazon and buy the book and read it, because that is the future that we could face. So, Guang Chen is uh, my friend, and he's also the distinguished uh, fellow at the Center for Human Rights, and his memoir is called The Barefoot Lawyer. Now, I know everybody listening is too young to probably remember this, but when he was imprisoned uh, in in the uh, early 2000s, around 2005, there was an international campaign to get him released from prison. Um he was nominated for the Nobel Prize. He's a blind man. You can see he's wearing glasses there. And so part of that international campaign was everybody was wearing glasses to get try to get him released. He had a miraculous escape from prison, which I'm not going to go through. But I'll tell you what, uh, you ought to read his book, uh, because how does a blind man escape who's under 24 hour a day, seven day a week surveillance by over 80 uh, apparatchiks of the Chinese Communist Party. I would say that's impossible, but he did. Um, so this, this, the, the engagement with China has been for many, many uh, decades, well, particularly particularly after Tiananmen Square, was, is it possible that democracy and human rights can flourish in China or can even begin to flourish? And so uh, that is still a very live question. Now, Guang Chen uh, believes it can happen, and we work for that in the Center for Human Rights. And we even have a weekly podcast called the Barefoot Lawyer Report. And you see in this book, again, uh, he's called the Barefoot Lawyer. And what? why is he called that? Because he, he, became, he was blind from, birth, or from, from early childhood. He grew up poor. He became a lawyer 
uh, without going to law school because they had no materials, no braille for a blind person to go to law school. So he learned it through having people read the law to him. And at that point in time, uh, I think it was Radio Free Asia had a, a number of uh, programs about the law in China. So he learned about Chinese law. And then what did he do with it? He didn't go out and make money and become rich. He represented the people who had nobody to represent them, disabled people who were discriminated against, and the rural poor people, the people in the villages of China who had no uh, body to support them against the kind of uh, powerful landlords. And then he also spoke out against uh, what would up to then had been a secret, which was the forced abortions under the Chinese Communist Party's uh, one-child policy, which were very brutal, uh, where women were forced to abort in very uh, primitive ways. And he did a report on it. He released it on the Internet. And he was then sent to prison. And so, uh, again, I'm telling you, you, there is no other place in the world where you can work with, learn from somebody like Chen Guang Chen. There is no other place. If you're interested in human rights, if you're interested in the greatest threat we face, uh, of a future surveillance state, he's the person. So he's a tremendous asset to our program, and I'm really glad we can work with him. Mm -hmm. As a student, it was incredible to be able to learn from him and to be able to sit in a class taught by him was just an awe-inspiring experience. He he truly is a, a very, very impressive person. Um, So... As we move on a little bit more into the nuts and bolts of the program, could you talk about the curriculum and the length of the program? Yeah. Uh, so it's 30 credit hours. And what that means is uh, 10 classes. And what that means is you can do it in one year, but it's very demanding because it's five graduate courses in the spring in the fall and five graduate courses in the spring. Now, uh, not everybody does it that way. You can also go part time. Um, there is no online option. We've thought about it and we may de uh, develop it in the future, but not now. So you have to be resident in D.C., if you have the ability to do five courses in a semester, you can finish in a year. If you'd like to make it longer, and sometimes we have people from other countries who need another semester or two, it can take uh, two years. Uh, if you're an American citizen uh, here in Washington and you're living in Washington and you're working full time, you can take as few as one course a semester, but that would take you five years because you'd be taking two a year and you have to take 10 courses. So, so to sum up, you can do it in one year if you have uh, the capacity to take that many courses. Most graduate students in the U.S. only take two or three courses a semester. But if you have the capacity to do five, you can finish in a year. If not, you can finish in two years uh, pretty uh, easily by going three three, uh, three and one or three three two two one etc. You just got to come up with ten, or it's even possible to go longer. I think that it depends on the person's situation. Um, I I don't think you have to do it one way or another. Like you'll still get the benefits of the program. The advantage of going in one year if you can handle it is as you were, Megan, you form a cohort of students who take their classes together, who know one another, help one another, who are known by the professors to be part of a cohort in the human rights program here at Catholic. And uh, that that is also very helpful. So if you can do it, that's a good thing to do. If you need to go part-time, that can be done. Um, 
I think you also act, asked about the curriculum. Um, mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, uh, it's interdisciplinary. So again, you can look at this on our website. Um, we have philosophy courses, theology courses, political theory courses, law courses. Um, what that particular, and, and also, uh, there's a menu you can see on the webpage, but I choose from that menu, and I put together a curriculum each year based on a lot of factors. So if you come in, you will take that curriculum. Um, there is some flexibility as maybe to take one uh, elective or, and this can be very helpful in looking for the job after graduation, is the possibility of an internship and an internship for credit. So you can work with a organization that you might want to uh, work with after you graduate. Great. And uh, aside from the 30 credit hours, are there any other requirements for graduation? Uh, well, I mean, like any master's students, you have to pass a comps exam. Um, uh, I'm not sure. Was there any other requirements for you, Megan? I can't recall right off the top of my head what it would be. Um, I do know that there is a minimum grade average of, I think, a B plus. Yeah, yeah, you have to. Yes, you have to maintain that level. You can't stay in graduate school. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, you have to. That's one something you have to think about when you're about going full time or part time. You have to be able to do at least a high B work. Um, great so um maybe we could talk a little bit about what the ideal candidate might look like um you know whether that's recent graduate been graduated for a while um wh what would that kind of look like yeah i could talk about it and the easy answer is there is no ideal candidate um if you just graduated from school a uh, college you can naturally go into a graduate program. Uh, if you're working full time, you know, in Washington, as I mentioned before, you can you can uh, get a your degree. Uh, many many jobs uh, reward you for getting another degree. If you're in between jobs and you want to get a graduate degree, so because you want to change careers, that can, that can uh, work for you as well. So I think the ideal candidate, the only thing about the ideal candidate is not those kind of object, those kind of objective things so much as it is, do you want to learn about human rights from the Catholic perspective? If you do, you're eligible. You're somebody we'll look at. If you don't, there's no point in even looking at my program. There's hundreds of programs in human rights in the United States. There's none like mine. And it's only for people who want to learn the Catholic perspective. So that that would be that's the ideal candidate. You have to have that. Great. And the application requirements. Um, what do those look like? Well, um, again, you go to the web page. There's a section within the web page about applications. Uh, it tells you what you have to submit. Um, uh, I mean, I'll ask you, Megan, if there's any specifics there you want to mention, but you have to submit what you would expect, like letters of recommendation, transcripts, a statement about why you're interested in this program. And nobody's admitted to this program who doesn't have a personal interview with me, uh, which can be by Zoom or in person in my office. Great, great. And um, through that application process, how are scholarships? given what that process look like? Yeah, I know that scholarships are important uh, for you students. Um, and the good news is that I have a fund of scholarship money. Uh, I was going to say the bad news, but reality, of course, is I don't have a bottomless fund. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's not a bottomless ocean. It's more like a, a well, and it has a certain amount of money. And that money is allocated and when it's allocated that's the end of the scholarships so if you are interested and it's now the first part of march 
you need to get moving because if the scholarship money is allocated and it's not allocated and you haven't gotten your application in or been admitted yet, uh, then you would you'd be out of luck. But the scholarships are uh, partially based on merit and partially based on need. Um, and every student uh, would be eligible for all of them, and I would expect every uh, student to get some help. But, um, you know, you have to think about this, and these are just tuition scholarships. There's, of course, the whatever the uh, financial requirements of living in Washington, D.C. are. But, of course, like any graduate student, there's a lot of them here at Catholic, and they live in group houses and things to reduce costs. Great. And you mentioned uh, application deadlines. So our I just wanted to say our priority deadline is has passed, but the uh, final deadline is July 1st for domestic students and June 15th for domestic or for international applicants. So if you're thinking about applying, definitely start working on that application and get it in. We have some incredible applicants, so we're excited to see all of your application. Yeah, and I would say to any of the any uh, non-U.S. citizens who are listening or who are interested, uh, you have to get a visa. You have to get a student visa. Now, some of you have gotten this kind of thing before, and you're very aware of it, but some of you aren't. And it's, uh, you know, the sooner you get moving on the visa, which you can't do apart from the university. So you have to first apply to the program, be admitted to the program, and then our kind of visa office helps you with that. That's That process can take some time. And also, uh, you, know, you, uh, you know, you can have issues with getting a visa from the U.S. depending on your country or depending on the circumstances. So it's, it's not, again, it's just a... Uh, prudential advice, which is uh, you need you need to get moving if you're interested in being here in the fall of 2024. Great. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, but we can go ahead and start with Professor Saunders, could you talk a little bit about some kind of outside the class events that the students might attend? I know we're in Washington, D.C., so there are some incredible events every year. Um, there are two off the top of my head that I can think of, um, the March for Life and the International Religious Freedom Summit. So yes. could you talk a little bit about both of those and what you and the students have done? Yeah, and the other thing I would just mention, because I agree with what you said, but I want to mention we have an annual human rights lecture, and sometimes uh, it's it's given by one of my advisory board members. We've had Robert George give it. Oh, I forgot to mention previously my advisory board member, John Keown, who is a Georgetown University philosopher, who is the world's expert on assisted suicide and uh, euthanasia. Uh, so he gave it, Flannery, uh, Father Flannery gave it, Robert George has given it. So that's something that's good. And the Institute for Human Ecology, which uh, we're affiliated with, is always has all these programs around campus that are interesting. And depending on your particular interests, you may want to uh, go to some of those. Uh, we also have had things like we screened um, a film about Jimmy Lai, who is the billionaire Hong Kong businessman who's gone to prison rather than uh, submit to the Chinese Communist Party. And we've had a we also had a film uh, premiere about uh, uh, Art Malik, who was one of the key figures in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, I, I want to just take two seconds of an aside on here because I haven't talked about it so far but and I know many people listening are much younger than than I am but even I am too young to have been around when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights came out 
because it came out in 1945, 48, following what? The Second World War. And if you haven't studied the history of the Second World War, you should, but the salient fact is there was, of all the people killed, two-thirds in that war were innocent people. They were not soldiers or sailors. They were innocent people. And their human rights were abused in, in hor horrific ways, such as the concentration camps. And then you add to that the fact that nuclear weapons had been developed and were used. Um, after the, As the war ended, the nations of the world realized we can't have a third world war or there will be no world left. So they set up the United Nations. And then three years after the United Nations was set up, they issued the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So that's an important document in our program. Um, I, I believe, as does Marianne Glendon and, and others in, in connected with the program, is that Catholic social thought is reflected in that document in very significant ways. So stepping back, that was another event we had was Art Malik, who's one of the absolute three or four most key people in getting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights issued. Uh, other events, like you you mentioned, Megan, is the Summit on International Religious Freedom, which is held um, you, every January in Washington, D.C. Uh, my students get to participate in a training session. Uh, the convener of the summit is former U.S. Ambassador for International Religious Freedom, Sam Brownback who is a good friend of, uh, of, of ours and of the program and who has a course that my students uh, take and who is associated as a fellow with the Center for Human Rights. And uh, then we have the March for Life, which Megan mentioned. And again, for Americans, you know this. For non-Americans, you may not. But the March for Life is uh, was started right after the decision legalizing abortion in the U.S., by the Supreme Court called Roe v. Wade, and it was just and for fifty years, for forty nine years, but essentially for fifty years, it governed in America in the USA, and basically it made abortion available for any reason at any time. And then uh, two years ago, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned that decision in another case called Dobbs, and the March for Life for fifty years was about how. To, to affirm, again, what I said before, the first right of Catholic social teaching, which is the right to life. And now that Dobbs has overturned Roe, the march is about how to build a culture of life. And again, anybody listening, I hope none of what I'm saying is new. If it is new, you'll learn about it in our program. But uh, as John Paul II said in his fantastic encyclical Evangelium Vitae, the first thing you have to do is defeat the culture of death, and then you have to build a culture of life. So the March for Life is a witness to the effort to defeat the culture of life, which had found this right to abortion, and now the march is about building a culture of life. And uh, it's always well attended, again, for international people who may not have been here usually hundreds of thousands of people. Um, it's in a cold time of year because it was in January that the Supreme Court announced Roe. So when the march started, it started in the same day that Roe had been announced. Anyway, I think, and it's the most, the, lo the longest running, most impressive human rights event in the world. So those are some of the things that are available to you uh, if you're part of the program. Great. Thank you, Professor Saunders. Um, let's look a little bit more at the question. Um, should one have to be Catholic in order to apply for the program? No, you don't have to be. I, uh, but so I have had, uh, I've had Protestants in the program or evangelicals and I've, uh, had a woman uh, with Islamic heritage. But you have to be in whether you're whether you're Catholic or not. You have to want to learn the Catholic perspective. Now, I happen to think that's uh, in a certain sense the best perspective because it gives you a deep 
understanding of what human rights are. And through John Paul II uh, in particular, um, and it gives you the philosophy and the uh, political theory and stuff to get a deep understanding, but you don't have to be Catholic. Great. Well, if there are no more questions, um, we can wrap up here. I am going to put in the chat Professor Saunders and my email so that if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us. There is Professor Saunders' email, and here is mine. And we are so grateful for everyone for attending the information session. Again, if you have any more questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Um, Professor Saunders, is there any closing words that you would like to give? Uh, well, the only thing I would mention is we can also put you in touch with current students or alumni, and you can learn more about the program. No, I think that this is, uh, obviously, uh, I think it's a great program. It's a unique program. And it's a program that's uh, badly needed in a world that doesn't understand what human rights are. Uh, as I think I indicated, almost everybody in the world would say they agree, yeah, that people have human rights. question is, what does it mean? Uh, one structuring answer to that is the Universal Declaration, but the, the other structuring element of that is Catholic social thought which gives you a deep understanding of the importance of the human person and of the common good. So yeah, I invite anybody who's interested to uh, either apply or ask us further questions. I look forward to seeing you in the class one day. Great. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.